I'm going to say, Mr. Bill, you break it. I can talk really loud. <laughs> it's the wire. Technology. It's the wire up by our hand. Medieval technology. Maybe it just needed to be a guy. <laughs> I can beat him up. Yes, you can. Thank you for coming out to our outdoor amphitheater by Firelight. We're excited, very excited to do this show for you tonight. This is the one and only time this production will be seen. Right before I came out, along with some of our technical difficulties, we found out that we have an emergency and one of our cast members has gone astray. <gasps> I lie not. And I need a volunteer from the audience that would be willing to take up the spear and join our crew and help us out this evening. So I'm, I'm, I'm not lying, but I honestly need three gentlemen to raise their hands. And, and I'm, I'm looking desperately. You, the goofy guy here, waving your hand back and forth. You come down. Thank you, sir. I, I need another two volunteers. Hold on. i got to come over here because I can't see. I would like you all to help me um, pick a replacement for my cast member that's gone awry. So um, they're, they're going to have you guys um, read their signs. And, and you're going to help me pick who gets to be Unther. We're going to start the gentleman on the end and he's going to show you his sign and I'd like you to interact with him and you go first Javen oh, oh. oh that was nice okay good good okay then let's ch try the gentleman in the center Good job, good job. Okay, crowd, on the count of three, you shout the word that you would like for me to choose to be our Unther for this evening. One, two, three. Huzzah! I'm afraid I heard huzzah. Huzzah. You two gentlemen, give them a hand, please. I think the light is almost ready for us. You guys just thought I liked to talk. <laughs> no, um, thank you for coming. Um, tonight, you guys have come to hear a story about kings and heroes. You've come to hear a story about friends and enemies. You've come to hear a story about good vanquishing evil. You've come to hear a story about mystery and truth. One of the things that they asked me to remind you, our company is but a small group of players. So much like our modern day soap operas, you could possibly see a character perish horribly in a scene and show up walking across the stage in the next scene. So please don't be confused. All right. Without any further ado, or a lottie, lottie, lottie from me, I give you Beowulf. Quid on that he were, world's kinanga, mana mildust, on mond werust, leodum lidust, on lof geos.
spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. They were shield chafes then. Scourge of many tribes. Wrecker of maid benches. Rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troop had come far. A foundling to start with. He would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying road would have to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was Was one good king. king. Afterwards, a boy child was born to shield, a cub in the yard. A comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew what they had come through without a leader, so... The Lord of life, the glorious glorious almighty, made made this this man renowned. renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Bayo's name was known throughout the north. And a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterwards, an age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Shield was still thriving when his time came, and he passed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to seas flood, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ring world prow rode into the harbor, outbound ice clad, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved lord on his boat, laid out by the mast, amid ships. The great ring giver. Mast treasure was loaded on top of him, and a gold standard set up high above his head, and they let him drift to wind and tide, bewailing him and mourning their loss. No man can tell. No wise man in hall or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. Then it fell to Bayo to keep the forts, and then his heir, the great half-dane, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they entered the world. Harogar, Hrothgar, the good Halga, and a daughter. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks. Young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. And so, his mind turned to hall building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide through the world, orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples, and soon it stood there, finished and ready, in full view, the Hall of Halls. Herod. was the name he had settled on it, whose utterance was law. Then, a powerful demon, a coward, through the dark nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the loud din of the banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet, telling with mastery of man's beginnings, how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves, and quickened life in every other thing that moved. was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time. <laughs> among the banished monsters, Cain's slam, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. With the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty made him anathema. And out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants too who strove with God time and again until he gave them their reward. So, after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house. Suddenly, the god-cursed brute was creating havoc. He grabbed 30 men from their resting places and rushed away to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. Then, as dawn brightened and day broke, Grindel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail was over. 
They wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, their storied leaders, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard. Staring, stunned, aghast at the demon's trail, in deep distress. Hrothgar was numb with grief, but got no respite. For one night later, merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance. For who could be blind to that Hall Watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right. One against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wall set. For twelve winters, seasons of woe, the Lord of the Shielding suffered under his load of sorrow. And so before long, the news was known over the whole world. All were endangered. Young and old alike were hunted down by that dark death shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these ravers from hell roam on their errands. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people. He took over Herod, haunted the glittering hall after dark. But the throne itself, the treasure, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. These were hard times, heartbreaking for the Prince of Shieldings. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes, at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of their souls might come to their aid and save their people. That was their way. Their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens, and high king of the world, was unknown to them. Oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace. For being help, he has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So that troubled time continued. Woe that never stopped. Steady affliction for half day in the sun. Too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by the terror. When he heard about Grendel, he, Alok Thane, was on home ground over in Gaeland. There was no, no one, one else, else like, like him alive. alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth. Highborn and powerful. He ordered a boat. A boat? That would fly the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road and search out that king, the famous prince who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens. And spurred his ambition to go, whilst he moved about, enlisting men, the best he could find. With 14 others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain. Over the waves, the wind behind her and foam in her neck, she flew like a bird until her curved prow had covered the distance. And on the following day, those seafarers sighted land, sunlit cliffs, sheer crags, and looming headlands. When the watchman on the wall, the shielding's lookout, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw shields glittering on the gangplank and battle equipment being unloaded, he had to find out who and what the arrivals were. What kind of men are you who arrive rigged out for combat in your coats of mail, sailing here over the sea lanes in your steep-hulled boat? I have been stationed as lookout on this coast for a long time, and my job is to watch the waves for raiders or any danger to the Danish shore. Never before has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries had allowed him safe passage or the clans had consented. Nor have I seen a mightier man at arms than the one standing here. Unless I am mistaken, he is truly noble. This is no mere hanger-on in a hero's armor. So before you fare inland as interlopers, I have to be informed as to who you are and where you hail from. Outsiders from across the water, I say it again. The sooner you tell me where you come from and why, the better. The leader of the troop unlocked his word hoard. The distinguished one delivered this answer. We belong by birth to the Gayet people. It owe allegiance to Heelok. My father was a famous man, a noble warrior lord named Exael. 
all over the world men remember him. We come in good faith to find your Lord and nation shield, the son of Halfdane. Give us the right advice and direction. Tell us if what we have heard is true about this death maker, this corpse mongerer, causing trouble in the shielding's country. I can show the wise Rothgar a way to defeat his enemy and find respite, if any respite is to reach him ever. I can calm the turmoil and terror in his mind. Otherwise, he must endure woes and live with grief for as long as his hall stands on the horizon. Undaunted, sitting astride his horse. Uh, <coughs> he, there's no horse. <laughs> <laughs> Undaunted, the Coast Guard answered. Anyone with gumption and a strong mind will take the notice of two things, what's said and what's done. I believe what you have told me, that you are a troop loyal to our king. So come ahead with your mail and your armor, and I will guide you. What's more, I will order my comrades on their word of honor to watch your boat down there on the strand to keep her safe and her tar fresh until the time comes for her prow to preen on the waves and to bear this hero back to Gateland. May one so valiant and venturesome come unharmed to the clash of battle. So they went on their way. The ship rode the water, broad beamed, bound by its hawser and anchored fast. Boar shapes flashed above their cheek guards, the finely forged work of goldsmiths watching over those stern faced men. They marched in step until the timbered hull rose before them radiant with gold. Nobody on earth knew another building like it. Majesty lodged there. Its light shone over many lands. And so their gallant escort guided them on their way to that dazzling stronghold, indicating the shortest way to it. Then the noble warrior wheeled on his horse <coughs> and spoke these words. It's time for me to go. May the Almighty Father keep you and in his kindness watch over your exploits. I'm away to the sea, back on alert against enemy raiders. Their mail shirts glinted, hard and hand-linked. The high-gloss iron of their armor rang. So they duly arrived at the hall in their grim war and gear, and weary from the sea stacked wide shields of the toughest hardwood against the wall, then collapsed on the benches. Battle dress and weapons clashed. They collected their spears in a seafarer's stook, a stand of grayish, tapering ash. And the troops themselves were as good as their weapons. Then a proud warrior questioned the men concerning their origins. Where do you come from carrying these decorated shields and shirts of mail, these cheek-hinged helmets and javelins? I am Rothgar's herald and officer. I have never seen so impressive or large an assembly of strangers. Stoutness of heart, bravery, not banishment, must have brought you to Rothgar. The leader of the Gaiads answered in return. We are retainers of Helok's band. Beowulf is my name. If your lord and master, the most renowned son of Halfdane, will meet me in person, I am ready and willing to report my errand. Wolfgar replied, a Wendell chief renowned as a warrior, well known for his wisdom and the temper of his mind. I will take this message to our noble king, our dear lord, friend of the Danes, the giver of rings. With that, Wolfgar turned to where Rothgar sat, an old man among retainers, the valiant follower stood four square in front of his king. He knew the courtesies. Wolfgar addressed his dear lord. People from Gaetland have put ashore. They have sailed far over the wide sea. They call the chief in charge of their band by the name of Beowulf. They beg my lord an audience with you, exchange of words and formal greeting. Most gracious Rothgar, do not refuse them, but grant them a reply. From their arms and appointment, they appear well-born and worthy of respect especially the one who has led them this far. He is formidable indeed. Rothgar, protector of the shieldings, replied. I used to know him when he was a young boy. His father before him was called Esdael. Rethel, the Geat, gave Esdael his daughter in marriage. This man is their son. Here to fall up an old friendship. A crew of seamen who sailed for me once with a gift cargo to Gaedland returned with marvelous tales about him. A fane, they declared, with the strength of thirty in, in the grip of each hand. Now, holy God, in his goodness, has guided him here to the West Danes to defend us from Grindel. This is my hope. Go immediately. Bid him and the gaiats he has in attendance to assemble and enter. And say, moreover, when you see them, they are welcome to Denmark. At the door of the hall, Wolfgar duly delivered the message. 
My lord, the conquering king of the Danes, bids me announce that he welcomes you here to Harrod and salutes your arrival from across the sea. You are free now to move forward in helmets and armor, but shields must stay here and spears be stacked until the outcome of the audience is clear. The hero arose, surrounded closely by his powerful thanes. A party remained under orders to keep watch over the arms. The rest proceeded, led by their prince, and standing on the hearth in his gleaming mail shirt, resolute in his helmet, Beowulf spoke. Greetings to Rothgar. I am Helok's kinsman, one of his half troop. When I was younger, I had great triumphs. Then news of Grendel, hard to ignore, reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in this legendary hall. How it lies deserted, empty, and even useless once the evening light hides itself under heaven's dome. So every elderman and experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Rothgar, because all knew of my awesome strength. They had seen me bolstered in the blood of enemies when I had battle and bound five beasts, raided a troll's nest, and in the night sea, slaughtered sea brutes. I have suffered extremes and avenged the Gaiats. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Sell the outcome in single combat. So my request to you, O King of Bright Danes, friend of the people and their ring of defense, my one request is that you won't refuse me who have come this far with my own men to help me and nobody else. I have heard, moreover, the monster scorns in his reckless way to use weapons, therefore to heighten Helok's fame and gladden his heart. I hereby renounce sword in shelter of the broad shield. Hand to hand is how it will be. A life and death fight with the fiend. Whichever one death fells must deem it a just judgment by God. Fate goes ever as fate must. Beowulf, my friend, you have traveled here to favor us with help and to fight for us. It bothers me to have burdened anyone after all the grief Grendel has caused and the havoc he has wrecked upon us here in Herat. Our humiliations... My household guards are on the wane. Fate sweeps them away into Grendel's clutches. But God can easily stop these raids and harrowing attacks. Time and again, when goblets passed, and seasoned fighters get flushed with beer, they would pledge themselves to protect Herat and wait for Grendel with wetted swords. But when dawn came in and broke through, over each empty blood-spattered bench, the floor of the mead hall where they have feasted, would be slick with slaughter, and so they died. Faithful retainers, and my following dwindle. Now take your place at the table. Relish the, the heroes to your heart's content. Huzzah! 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 Oh, yeah. Huzzah! 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 Born again, 
sure of his throne! <laughs> I'm not finished! <laughs> Rekka, may good is burst upon you, and it's proved right! No matter, therefore, have you men fair in every bath and battle until now! Yeah, this time you'll be worsted! <laughs> I said worsted! <laughs> You've had your say about Brecca and me, but it was mostly the beer that was doing the talking. <laughs> the truth is, when the going was heavy in those high waves, I was the strongest swimmer of all. We've been children together and dare ourselves to outdo each other on the sea. And so it was, each of us swam for five nights, swimming with our swords for protection against the whale beasts. Then, the deep boiled up, its wallowings to the sea brutes wild. My armor kept me safe when some ocean creature pulled me to the bottom. Pinion fat and swad in its grip, I was rid of one chance. My sword plunged, and the ordeal was over. Through my own hands, the fury of battle had finished off the sea beast. Time and time again, foul things attacked me, but I lashed out with my sword. My flesh was not for feasting on. Instead, in the morning, Sleeping the sleep of the sword, they sloughed and they floated like the ocean's leavings. There'd be no ocean creatures gloating over their banquet at the bottom of the sea. Instead, a light arose. Bright guarantee of God, from now on, sailors would be safe. I could see headlands and buffeted cliffs. Often, for undaunted courage, fate, fate spares, spares the man. It is not already marked. Now, friend Unferth, I cannot recall any fight that you've entered that bears comparison. Oh! <laughs> you were never but celebrated for swordsmanship or for facing danger in the field of battle. Ooh. You did kill your own kith and kin. Oh. And so far, for all your cleverness and quick tongue, you will suffer damnation in the depths of hell. Oh. The fact is, Undferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grindel would never have gotten away with such unchecked atrocities. Attacks on your king, <coughs> havoc and hair and horrors everywhere. But he knows he need never be in dread of your blade making a mizzle of his blood. He knows he can treble down new Danes to his heart's content. Humiliate and murder to his heart's content. Humiliate and murder without fear of reprisal. But he will find me different. Huzzah! Huzzah! Then the gray-haired treasure giver was glad. Far famed in battle, the prince of bright Danes counted on Beowulf, on the warrior's steadfastness and his word. So the laughter started, the din got louder, and the crowd got <laughs> Until Welfeo came in, Rothgar's queen, observing the courtesies. Arrayed in gold, she graciously saluted the men in hall. Then handed the cup first to Rothgar, their homeland's guardian, urging him to drink deep and enjoy it because he was dear to them. Yes! Oh! 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 And he drank it down like the warlord he was with a <laughs> festive cheer. So the helming woman went on her rounds, queenly and dignified, decked out in rings, offering goblet to all ranks, treating the household and the assembled troop until it was Beowulf's turn to take the cup from her hand. With measured words, she welcomed the Gayat, thanking God for granting her wish that a deliverer she might believe in would arrive to ease their afflictions. He accepted the cup. I had a fixed purpose when I put out to sea. As I sat in my boat with my band of men, I meant to do to the uttermost what your people wanted, or perish in the attempt in the fiend's clutches. 
I will prove myself with a proud deed or meet my death here in the meat hall. This formal boast by Beowulf the Gaiad pleased the lady well. Sit by Ruthgar, regal and arrayed in gold. Then it was like old times in the echoing hall. Proud talk and the people happy, loud and excited. Until, soon enough, Halfdane's heir had to be away to his night's rest. He realized the demon was going to descend on the hall, that he had plotted all day from dawn light until darkness. As the company arose, the two took leave of each other. Rothgar wished Beowulf health and good luck, named him Hall Warden, and announced... Never since my hand could hold a shield have I entrusted or given the control of Danes to anyone but you. Ward and guard it, for it is the greatest of houses. Be on your mettle now. Keep in mind your fame. Beware of the enemy. There's nothing that won't be yours if you win through alive. Rothgar departed then with his house guard. The king of glory, as people learned, had posted a lookout for Grendel who was his match. And the Gayot placed complete trust in his strength of limb and the Lord's favor. He began to remove the iron breast mail, took off the helmet, and handed the attendant his patterned sword, a smith's masterpiece. And before he bedded down, Beowulf, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted, when it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grindel. So it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down, easily as I might. He has no idea of the art of shield or swordplay. No weapons, therefore, for either this night. Unarmed he shall face me, if face me he dares. And may the Almighty Lord, in his infinite wisdom, grant the glory to victory to whichever side he sees fit. None of them expected he would ever see his homeland again. But the Lord was leaving a victory on his war loom for the weather gay ads. Through the strength of one, they would all prevail. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The, the truth, truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind and always has. He moved towards it until it shone above him, a sheer keep of fortified gold. Spurned and joyless, he arrived at the barn. The iron brace door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, while a baleful light flamed. He saw many men in the mansion sleeping. And his glare was demonic, picturing the mayhem. Before morning, he would rip life from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh. But his fate that night was due to change. The days of his ravening had come to an end. Mighty and canny, Beowulf was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make. Lord of the creature, keep him waiting. But struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone, pulled him down his blood, and gorged on him in lumps. Venturing closer, his talent was raised. To attack Beowulf! When the alert heroes come back, an arm lock forestalled him utterly. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he'd ever encountered on the face of the earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. The dread of the land in all his days had never been clamped or cornered like this. Fingers were bursting. The monster back dropping. The man overpowering. He wanted to flee to his lair in the fen. It was the worst trip the terrible. And now, 
The timbers trembled and sang a hall session that harrowed every Dane inside the stockade. Stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. As the pair struggled, mead benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold pinnings and all. Before then, no shielding elder would believe any power or person on earth capable of wrecking their horn rigged hall. Then, an extraordinary wail arose, and bewildering fear came over the Danes. Everyone felt it who heard it as it echoed off the doors of the hall. A god-cursed scream, a strain of catastrophe, the lament of the loser, the howl of the house surf keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by that man, who of all men was foremost and strongest in the days of his life. Time and again, Beowulf's Thanes worked to defend their lord's life, laying about them as best they could with their ancestral blades. But when they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time. That no blade on earth, the blast of art, could ever damage their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from the cutting edge of every weapon. But his going away out of this world in the days of his life would be agony to him. And he would travel far into alien themes keeping. Then he would the hearts of men with pain and given offense to God, found that his bodily powers failed him. Beowulf kept him helplessly locked in a hand grip. As long as either lived, he was faithful to the other. The monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning! Huzzah! 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 was driven to his desolate lair. The end of his life was coming over him. He knew it for certain. One bloody clash had fulfilled the dearest wishes of the Danes. The man who had lately landed among them, proud and sure, had purged the hall. The hero displayed high up near the roof, the whole of... <laughs> his awesome grasp. Morning came, and many a warrior gathered around the gift hall. Clan chiefs flocking from far and near down wide-ranging roads, staring aghast at the demon's footprints. His fatal departure was regretted by no one. The ignominious marks of his flight where he'd skulked away, exhausted in spirit and beaten at battle, bloodying the path, hauling his doom to the demon's mere. The bloodshot water surged and wallowed. There were loathsome upthrows and overturnings of waves and gore and wound slurry. With his death upon him, he had dived deep into his marsh den, drowned out of his life. And his heathen soul. Hell claimed him there. <laughs> then away they rode, the old retainers, with many a young man following after them on horseback, in high spirits on their bay steeds. Beowulf's doings were praised over and over again. Nowhere, they said, north or south between the two seas, or under the tall sky on the broad earth. Was there anyone better to raise a shield or to rule a kingdom? Yet, there was no laying of blame on their king, the noble Rothgar. He was a good king. The light of day broke and kept brightening. Bands of retainers galloped in excitement to the gabled hall to see the marble. And the king himself, the guardian of the ring lord, goodness in person, walked in majesty to the mead hall. Gazing at the roof work and Grendel's talon. First and foremost, let the Almighty Father be thanked for this sight. I have suffered a long and harrowing by Grendel, but the Heavenly Shepherd, Shepherd can work his wonders, wonders always and everywhere. everywhere. Not long since, it would seem I would never be granted the slightest solace or relief from any of my burdens. The best of houses glittered, reeked, and rang with blood. So now, I adopt you in my heart as a dear son. There's nothing you'll want for. I have often recognized warriors that are not nearly as worthy, lavish rewards on the less deserving. But you have made yourself immortal by your glorious actions. May the God of ages keep you and requite you well. We have gone through with a glorious endeavor and been much favored in this fight. Nevertheless, I would have been more well pleased if you could have seen where the monster lay beaten and broken. My plan was to pounce and pin him down, grapple him to death, but I could not stop him from slipping my hold. 
Nevertheless, he left his hand, his arm, and shoulder behind, a cold comfort for coming among us. Now, he is not long for the world. The wound will end him. He is hasped and hooped and hurbling with pain, limping and looped in it. Like a man outlawed for wickedness, he must must await the mighty judgment of God and majesty. There was less tampering and big talk then from Unferth, the boaster, <laughs> less of his blather as the Hallfanes eyed the awful proof of that hero's prowess. Then the order was given to refurbish Harrow immediately. Men and, and women, women thronging, thronging the wine hall. <laughs> But Iron Brace has the inside of a cabin that bright blue away in rooms now. The very doors have been dragged from their hinges. Only the roof remained unscathed by the time the guilt foul fiend turned tail in despair for his life. But death is not easily escaped from by anyone. All of us are souls. Earth dwellers and children of men must make, make our way to a destination already ordained for the body. After the banqueting, sleeps on his deathbed. Then the due time came for half dame time to proceed to the hall. The king himself would sit down to feast. No group ever gathered in greater numbers or better order around their ring dinner. The benches were filled with famous men who fell to with relish. Round upon round a mead was passed. Those powerful kinsmen, Rosegar and Rolfroof, were in high spirits in the raftered hall. Inside Harrow, there was nothing but friendship. The shielding nation was not yet familiar with feud of betrayal. Then half Dane's son proceeded to give Beowulf a gold standard as a victory gift. An embroidered banner, breast veil, and a helmet with the sword carried high. That was both a precious object and token of honor. So Beowulf drank his drink at ease. It was hardly a shame to be showered with such gifts in front of the hall troops. There have not been many moments, I am sure, when men exchanged four such treasures at so friendly a sitting. Then the chieftain went on to reward each man on the bench, each man who had sailed with Beowulf and risked the voyage a bounty. A price in gold was settled on the Geat Grindel had cruelly killed earlier. Best you would have killed more had not mindful God. And one man's daring prevented that doom. Past and, and present, present. God's, God's will, will prevails. Hence understanding is always best in a prudent mind. For whoever remains long on this earthly life will enjoy and endure more than enough. They played then to please the hero. Words and music for their warrior prince. Harps, tunes, and tales of adventure. A pleasant murmur started on the benches, and stewards did round with wine and with splendid jugs. And then, Welfeo came in to sit between uncle and nephew. Unferth, admired by all for his mind and courage, although under a cloud for killing his brothers, reclined near the king. Enjoy this drink, my most generous lord. Raise up your goblet. Entertain the gaiets duly and gently. Relish their company. But recollect as well all of the boons that have been bestowed on you. The bright court of Harrow has been cleansed. And now the word is that you want to adopt this warrior as a son. So while you may bask in your fortune and then bequeath kingdom and nation to your kith and kin before you decease, I am certain of Rothulf. He is noble and will use the young ones well. He will not let you down. Should you die before him, he will treat our children truly and fairly. He will honor, I am sure, our two sons. Repay them in kind when he recollects all the good things we gave him once, the favor and respect he found in his childhood. She moved then to the bench where her boys sat, Prethic and Rothman, with other noble sons. And that good man, Beowulf the Gaeth, sat between the brothers. The cup was carried to him, kind words spoken in welcome, and a wealth of wrought gold graciously bestowed. Applause filled the hall. Filled the hall. Well, feel pronounced in the presence of this company. Take delight in this torque, dear Beowulf. Wear it for luck, and wear also this mail from our company's armory. May you prosper in them. 
Be acclaimed for strength, and your bounty will be sure. You have won renown. You are known to all men far and near, now and forever. Your sway is wide as the wind's home, as the sea around cliffs. And so, my prince, I wish you a lifetime's luck and blessings to enjoy this treasure. Treat my sons with tender care. Be strong and kind. Here each comrade is true to the other, loyal to Lord, loving in spirit. The Thanes have one purpose. The people are ready. Having drunk and pledged, the ranks do as I bid. She moved then to her place. Men were drinking wine at that rare feast. How could they know fate? The, the grim, grim shame of things, things to come. come. Threat looming over many thanes as night approached, and King Rothgar prepared to retire to his quarters. Retainers were posted on guard, as so often in the past. Benches were pushed back, bedding spread across the floor, and one man already marked for death. At their heads they placed their polished timber battle shields, and on the bench above them each man's kit was kept to hand. A towering war helmet, webbed mail shirt, and great shafted spear. It was their habit to be ready for action, always and everywhere, at home or in the camp, in whatever time, in whatever case, the need arose. They went to sleep. And one paid dearly for his night's ease. An avenger lurked. Still alive, grimly biding her time. Grendel's mother. Monstrous hell bride. on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths, after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword branded. An outlaw! Marked by having murdered, he moved. Into the wilds, shun company, and joy. And from Cain there sprang. Among them, Grendel. The banished and accursed. Do to come to grips with that watcher in Harrowed waiting to do battle. The monster wrenched and wrestled with him, but Beowulf was mindful of his mighty strength. The wondrous gifts God had showered on him. So he overcame that foe. Broken and bowed, outcast from all sweetness. But now his mother had sallied forth on a savage journey. Grief wrapped and ravenous, desperate for revenge, she came to Harrowt. Inside the hall, Danes lay asleep. Earls who would soon endure a great reversal once Grendel's mother attacked and entered. Then in the hall, hard hung swords were grabbed and many a broad shield lifted and braced. There was little thought of woven mail or web mail shirt once she had attacked. They awoke in terror. The hell dam was in panic the moment she was found. She had pounced and taken one of their retainers to the title. And then she headed to the fed. To Rothgar, this man was the most beloved of the friends he trusted between the two seas. Beowulf, Beowulf was, was elsewhere. elsewhere. Earlier after the award of the treasure, Beowulf had been given another lodging. There was uproar in Herod. She had snatched their trophy, Grendel's bloody to harm. The old lord was heart sore and weary when he heard the news. His highest placed advisor, his dearest companion, was dead and gone. Beowulf was quickly brought to where the king waited in his wisdom, wondering whether Almighty God would ever turn the tide of his misfortune. So Beowulf entered with his band in attendance and quickly hurried to the prince to ask if he had rested, since the urgent summons had come as a surprise. Rest. What is rest? Sorrow has returned. Alas for the Danes. Usher is dead. He was a soulmate to me. A true mentor. My right-hand man when the ranks class had to take a battering in the line of action. Usher was everything the world admired in a wise man and a friend. Then this Roman killer came in Herald and slaughtered him. Where she is hiding. Glutting on the corpse and glorying in her escape. I cannot tell. She had taken up the feud because of last night when you killed Grendel. It was said by my people in Hall. Counselors who live in the upland country that they have seen two such creatures prowling in the moors. Huge marauders from some other world. One thing, as far as anyone could ever discern, looks like a woman. The other, warped in the shape of a man, moves beyond the pell bigger than any man. An unnatural birth called Grendel by country people in former days. 
They are father's creatures. Their whole past is hidden in the past of demons and ghosts. They dwell among wolves on windswept crags. Treacherous, where cold streams pour down the mountain and disappear under mist and moorland. A few miles from here, a frost-stiffened wood waits and watch above a mirror, a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface. At night, something uncanny happens. The water burns. On its bank, with a heart in flight, flees from pursuing hounds and turns to face them in dying wood rather than dive beneath its surface. That, that is, is no, no good, good place. place. Now hope depends on you and you alone. The gap where the demon awaits is still unknown to you. Seek it, if you dare. Why, sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. For when a warrior passes, that will be his best and only bulwark. So arise, my lord. Let us immediately set forth on the trail of the troll dam. She will have nowhere to flee to, not to dens underground, nor upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She will not get away. Endure your troubles today. Bear up and be the man I expect you to be. With that, the old lord sprang to his feet and praised God for Beowulf's pledge. And then the wise king mounted the royal saddle and rode out in style with a force of shield bearers. The forest paths were marked all over with the demon's tracks. Her trail wherever she had gone across the ground, dragging away the body of Rothgar's best counselor. So the noble prince proceeded up fells and screes, along narrow footpaths and ways, where they were forced into single file. Ledges on cliffs above layers of water monsters. He went in front with a few men, good judges of the lie of the land, until they discovered the dismal wood, mountain trees growing out at an angle above gray stones. The bloodshot water surged underneath. It was a sore blow to all of the Danes, friends of the Shieldings, a hurt to each and every member of that noble company when they came upon Ashura's head at the foot of the cliff. Everybody gazed as the hot gore wallowed up. An urgent war horn repeated its notes, and the entire party sat down to watch. There were writhing sea dragons and serpents that slouched on slopes by the cliff. Many monsters loomed under the water. There was a hilted weapon. An item lent by Unferth that was of no small importance. It was by the name of Frugting. It had never failed in battle. The blade had been tempered with blood. And when he lent that blade to the better swordsman, Unferth could hardly have remembered that ranting speech he made in his cups. <laughs> he was not man enough to face the turmoil of a fight underwater, so there he lost his fame and repute. The Prince of the Weather Gats plunged suddenly. It was the best part of the day before he could see the solid bottom. The one who haunted these waters, who had scavenged and gone her gluttonous rounds for a hundred seasons, sensed a human observing her lair from above. So she lunged and clutched. And managed to catch him in her brutal grip. But her savage talons failed to rip the web of his war short. Then, once she touched bottom, that wolfish swimmer carried the ring-mailed prince to her court so that for all his courage he could never use the weapons he carried. A bewildering horde came at him from the depths, droves of sea beasts to attack with tufts and tore at his chainmail in ghastly onslaught. He had entered some hellish turnhole, and yet the water did not work against him because the hull roofing kept off the force of the current. Then he saw firelight, a gleam and flare up, a glimmer of brightness. The hero observed the Tarnhag in all her terrible strength. Then the hero heaved his war sword and swung his arm. The decorated blade came down ringing and singing on her head, but he soon found his battle torch extinguished. His shining blade refused to bite. He had gone through many hand-to-hand -hand fights. He had hewed the armor and the helmets of the doomed. But here at last, the fabulous powers of that heirloom had failed. Then in a fury, he flung his sword away would have to rely on the might of his arm. So must a man do who intends to get enduring glory in a combat. Life doesn't cost him a thought. Then the Prince of Wargates, warming to this fight with Grendel's mother, gripped her shoulder and laid about him in a battle frenzy. Then he pitched his 
your opponent before. But she rose quickly and retaliated, grappled him tightly in her grim embrace. The sure-footed fighter felt daunted. The strongest of warriors stumbled and fell. So she pulled out a broad wedded knife. Now she would avenge her only child. But the straw the links and locks of Beowulf's war gear helped to shield his life, turned to the edge and tip of the blade. The son of Edgefay would surely have perished had not the mesh of chainmail on his shoulder shielded his life. Holy God decided to victory. It was easy for the Lord, the ruler of heaven, to redress this balance once Beowulf got back up on his feet. Then he saw a blade that voted well, a sword in her armory, an ancient heirloom from the days of the giants, an ideal weapon, one that any warrior would envy, but so huge and heavy of itself, only Beowulf could wield it in a battle. So, the shielding's hero, hard pressed and enraged, took a firm hold of the hilt and swung his war sword in an arc, a resolute blow that bit deep into her neck bone and severed it entirely. Toppling the doomed house of her flesh, she fell to the floor. The sword dripped blood. The swordsman was elated, and light appeared, and the place brightened the way the sky does when heaven's <laughs> candle is shining clearly. He inspected the vault. Now the weapon was to prove its worth. The hero determined to take revenge for every gross act Grendel had committed. And not only for that one occasion when he came to slaughter the sleeping troops. Fifteen of Wolfgar's house guards surprised on their benches and ruthlessly devoured, and as many again dragged away, a brutal plunder. Beowulf, in his fury, now settled that score. He saw the monster in its resting place, war-weary and wrecked, a lifeless corpse, a casualty of the battle in Harrowed. The body gaped at the stroke dealt to it after death. Beowulf cut the corpse's head off. The ninth, the ninth hour, hour of the day arrived. arrived. The brave shieldings abandoned the clifftop, and the king went home. But sat at heart, staring at the mirror, the strangers held on. They wished, without hope, to behold their lord, Beowulf himself. He who wields power over time and time, he is the true lord. The Gaiac captain saw treasure in abundance, but carried no spoils for himself, except for the head and the inlaid hilt embossed with jewels. Its blade had melted, and the scrollwork on it burnt, so scalding was the blood of the poisonous fiend who had perished there. Then away he swam. The water was no longer infested once the wandering fiend let go of her life. The leader was delighted with the mighty load he was lugging to the surface. His thanes advanced to meet him, taking great delight in seeing their leader back safe and sound. With high hearts, they headed away. It was a task for four to hoist Grendel's head on a spear and bear it under strain to the bright hall. But soon enough, they neared the place. Fourteen gaets and fine fettles striding along the outlying ground. In he came then to address Rothgar. His courage proven, his glory secured. <laughs> Grendel's head was hauled by the hair, dragged across the ground where people were drinking, a horror for Queen and company to behold. They stared in awe. It was an astonishing sight. Son of Halfdane, Prince of the Shieldings, this from the lake is a token of triumph that we tender to you. I would not have survived the battle underwater had God himself not intervened. Though Runting is hard-edged, I can never bring it to bear in battle. But the Lord of Men allowed me to behold, for he often helps the unbefriended, an ancient sword there in the wall. It was a weapon made for giants, but I wielded it. My moment came in the combat, and I struck the dwellers in that den. The next thing, the demostented blade melted. It bloated, and it burned in their rushing blood. I wrestled the hilt from the enemy's hand and avenged the gains. It is what was due. In this I pledge, O oh King of Herod, you can sleep secure. The gold hilt was handed over, a relic from long ago, to the Prince of the Danes. It was inscribed all over and told how war first came into the world and how the flood destroyed the tribe of giants. They suffered a terrible severance from the Lord, for the Almighty drowned them in a deluge for retribution. In pure gold inlay on the sword guards, there were rune markings correctly incised, stating and recording for whom the sword had been first made and ornamented. And everyone hushed as the son of Hafdane spoke his wisdom. A protector of his people, pledged to uphold truth and justice, and the 
and to respect tradition is entitled to affirm that this man was born into distinction. Beowulf, my friend, your fame has gone far and wide. You are known everywhere. In all things, you are even-tempered, prudent, and resolute. So I stand firm by the promise of friendship we exchanged before. You will for forever be your people's mainstay and your own warrior's helping hand. Heramod was different. The way he behaved to Edgewala's sons, his rise in the world brought little joy to the Danish people, only death and destruction. He vented his rage on men he caroused with, killed his own comrades, a pariah king who comes so far from his own people. Even though Almighty God made him eminent and powerful, and they start for a happy life, but a change happened. He grew bloodthirsty, gave no more rings to honor the Danes. He suffered in the end for plaguing his people for so long. His life lost happiness. So learn from this. I, who tell you, have wintered into wisdom. It is a great wonder how Almighty God, in his magnificence, favors our race with rank and scope and the gift of wisdom. His sway is wide. Sometimes he allows the mind of a man of distinguished birth to follow its bents, grants him fulfillment and felicity on earth, and forces him to command his own country. He permits him to lord it in many lands until the man in his mind forgets who ever in for him. He indulges his desires. Illness and old age mean nothing to him. His mind is untroubled with envy or malice or the thought of enemies with their hate honed swords. The whole world conforms to his will until an element of overweening enters him and takes hold the soul's guard. It's centuries, Drez has grown too distracted. A killer stalks him, an archer with a deadly bow, and then the man is hit in the heart. The arrow flies beneath his defenses and the devious promptings of a demon starts. His old possessions seem paltry to him now. He covets, resents, dishonors custom, and bestows no gold. And because of the heavenly powers that was given to him before, he forgets the shape of things to come. Then finally, the end arrives, when the body he was lent collapses and falls prey to its death. Ancestral goods that he hoarded or inherited by another, and then let go with a liberal hand. O oh, flower of warriors, beware of that trap. Choose dear bear wolf, eternal rewards. Do not give away to pride, for your strength is in a bloom, but it fades quickly. Or soon illness will come, or the sword delay you low. A jabbing blade, a javelin from rebellion age, and then soon your eye will dim and darken, and then death will arrive. Oh, dear warrior, to sweep you away. Just so I have ruled the Danes for over 50 years, defending them in wartime with sword in hand from many tribes. I have thought my enemies have fallen from the face of the earth, but what happened was a hard reversal from bliss to grief. And then Grendel weighed lace to the land. Then my mind was in dread. So I think, dear God, that I can finally look at triumph at last. So with pride and pleasure, move to the feast. Soon all was restored. Happiness came back. The hall was thronged and a banquet set forth. Black night fell and covered them in darkness. The guest was weary, so a house guard guided him out. And that great heart rested. A hall towered. Gold shingled and gabled, and the guests slept in it until the black raven with raucous glee announced heaven's joy, and a hurry of brightness overran the shadows. Warriors rose quickly, impatient to be off, and they sailed from Denmark. Thus, Beowulf bore himself with valor. He was formidable in battle, yet behaved with honor, and took no advantage. Never cut down a comrade who was drunk, kept his temper, and warrior that he was watched and controlled his God-sent strength and outstanding natural powers. He had been poorly regarded for a long time, was taken by the Gaets for less than he was worth, and their lord, too, had never much esteemed him in the Mead Hall. They firmly believed that he lacked force, 
that the prince was a weakling. But presently, every affront to his deserving was reversed. A lot was to happen in later years in the fury of battle. Kelak fell. Ruthless swordsmen with cruel force cut him down. So that afterwards, the wide kingdom reverted to Beowulf. He ruled it well for fifty winters. Grew old and wise. faults of a barrel where he guarded a hoard. There was a hidden passage, unknown to man, but someone managed to enter and interfere with the trove. He had handled and removed a gem-studded goblet. It gained him nothing, though with the thieves' wiles he outwitted the sleeping dragon that drove him into rage, as the people of that country would soon discover. The intruder who broached the dragon's treasure and moved him to wrath had never meant to. Desperation on the part of the slave, fleeing the heavy hand of some master, guilt ridden and on the run, going to ground. But soon he began to shake with terror. In shock, the wretch panicked and ran away with the precious metalwork. There were many other heirlooms heaped inside that earth house, because long ago, with deliberate care, Somebody now forgotten buried the riches of a high-born race in that ancient cache. Then, an old harrower of the dark happened to find the hoard open. The burning one who hunts out barrows. The slick-skinned dragon threatening the night sky with streamers of fire. People in farms are in dread of him. For three centuries, the scourge of the people had stood guard on that stoutly protected underground treasury. Until the intruder. The ball was busted. The dragon awoke. Trouble flared. He rippled down the rock, writhing with anger when he saw. What press? Of the prowler who had stolen too close to his dreamy head. He scoured and hunted for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. Hot and savage. He kept circling. The dragon began to belch out flames and burn bright homesteads. There was a hot love that scared everyone. With the vile skyline, it would leave nothing alive in his voice. Far and near, the Gaat nation bore the brunt of his virulent hate. Then back to the horde he would dart just before daybreak to hide in his den. Then, Beowulf was given the bad news. His Burnt to a cinder. The throne room, the gates. It threw the hero into deep anguish and darkened his mood. The wise man thought he must have thwarted an ancient ordinance of the eternal Lord, <coughs> broken his commandment, and accustomed anxiety and gloom confused his brain. After many trials, he was destined to face the end of his days in this mortal world. As was the dragon and his long lease hold on the treasure. Yep, the Prince of Rings was too proud to line up with a large army against the Sky Plague. He had scant regard for the dragon as a threat. No dread of his courage or his strength. For he had kept going often in the past, through perils and ordeals of every sort, after he had beaten Grendel, the son of Edgetheo. Had survived every extreme. Excelling himself and daring and in danger until the day arrived he had to come face to face with the dragon. The lord of the Gaats took eleven comrades and went in a rage to reconnoiter. By then he had discovered the cause of the, affl the affliction being visited on by the people. The precious cup had come to him from the hand of the finder, the one who had started all this strife and was now added as a thirteenth to their number. 
say the press thing to compel this poor creature to be their guide. Against his will, he led them to the earth vault he alone knew. An underground barrel near the sea billows and heaving waves heaped inside with exquisite metalwork. The one who stood guard was dangerous and watchful. No easy bargain would be made in that place by any man. So Beowulf, Beowulf gave a formal, formal boast, boast for, the for the last time. I risked my life often when I was young. But now I am old. But as king of this people, I shall pursue this fight for the glory of winning. If only the evil one will abandon his earth fort, face me in the open, I would rather that I not use a weapon, but I will be facing molten venom in the fire he breathes. Therefore, I shall go forth in mail shirt and shield. The fabled warrior in his war shirt and shield trusted in his own strength entirely and went under the crag. No coward path. Then he gave a shout, a storm of anger under the gray stone. Hate! was ignited. The horde guard recognized a human voice. Pouring forth in hot battle fume, the breath of the monster burst from the rock. There was a hot rumble underground. Beowulf lifted his shield, and the outlandish thing writhed and convulsed, and viciously turned on the king, whose sword was already in his hand. fury! Each struck tear in the other. Unyielding, the lord of his people loomed sure, while the serpent unleashed itself. Swaddled in flames, it came racing towards its fate. Yet, the shield defended the renowned leader's life for a shorter time than he had meant it to. The blade flashed, yet the blow was far less powerful than the hard-pressed king had in need of at that moment. The glittering sword, infallible before that day, failed. It is no easy thing to have to give ground like that and go unwillingly to inhabit another home in a place beyond. So every man has sealed the leaseholds of his days. The Horde Guard took heart. He swelled up and got a new wind. He who had once ruled was furled in fire and had to face the worst. No help or backing was to be had then from his comrades. That hand-picked troop broke ranks and ran for their lives to the safety of the woods. But within one heart, sorrow welled up. In a man of worth, the claims of kinship cannot be denied. His name was Wiglaf. When he saw his lord being tormented by the heat, he remembered the bountiful gifts bestowed on him, how well he lived, the freehold he inherited. He could not hold back. One hand brandished the shield, the other drew his sword to enter the line of battle with his lord. His first time being tested as a fighter. His spirit did not break. Sad at heart, addressing his companions, Miglas spoke, wise and fluent words. I remember a time when mead was flowing. We pledged loyalty to our lord in the hall. Promised our ring giver we would be worth our price. He picked us out, honored us, judged us fit for this action. All because he considered us to be the best of his arms bearing fans. And now, although this challenge is one he wanted to face by himself alone, the shepherd of our land, a man unequaled in the quest for glory. Now the day has come when this Lord we serve needs sound men to give him their support. Let us go to him. Help our leader through the hot flame. As God is my witness, I will rather my body were robed in the same burning blaze as my gold giver's body than to go back home bearing arms. I know well the things he has done for us deserve better. So he waded the dangerous streak and went under arms to his lord, saying only, Go on, dear Beowulf. Do everything you said you would when you were still young and vowed you would never let your name and fame be dimmed while you lived. Stay resolute. Defend your life now with the whole of your strength. I shall stand by you. Those words! A wildness rose on the dragon again, driving it to attack, heaving up fire. Flames lapped at the shield. The young warrior charted to the boss. The body armor on the young warrior was useless to him. 
But Wiglaf stood well under the wide rim Beowulf shared with him, once his own had shattered in his hearts and ashes. Inspired again by the thought of glory, the war king threw his whole strength behind a sword stroke and connected his skull. Annihiling snout! Beowulf's ancient iron gray sword let him down in the fight. The fire-breathing dragon caught the hero in a rush of flames, clamped sharp veins into his neck. Beowulf's body ran wet with his lifeblood. The war king drew a stabbing knife he carried in his belt, sharpened for battle. He stuck it deep into the dragon's flank. Beowulf dealt it a deadly wound. Then the wound dealt by the ground burner earlier began to scald and swell. Beowulf found deadly poison separating inside him. And then that thane, unequal for goodness, with his own hands, washed his lord's wounds, swabbed his weary prince with water, bathed him clean, unbuckled his helmet. Beowulf spoke. In spite of his wounds, mortal wounds, he still spoke. He knew well his days in this world had been lived out to the end. His allotted time was drawing to a close. Death was very near. Now, now is the time that I would have wanted to bestow this armor on my own son. Had it been my fortune to have fathered an heir and lived on in his flesh. For 50 years I ruled this nation. I took what came. I stood by and cared for things in my keeping. I never swore to a lie, never fomented a quarrel, and all this consoles me, doomed as I am. Where are you going, Wiglaf? Under the gray stone, where the dragon is laid out, lost to his treasure. Feast your eyes on the Lord. I want to examine. Away you go. I want to examine that ancient gold. Gaze my fill on those garnered jewels. All my going will be easier for having seen the treasure. And so I have heard the son of Wakestan. Quickly obeyed the command of his war weary lord. He went in his chainmail under the rock piled roof and saw beyond the seat a treasure trove of astonishing riches. Wall hangings that were a wonder to behold. Fluttering gold spread across the ground. Rusty helmets, all eaten away. Armbands everywhere, artfully wrought. How easily treasure buried in the ground. Gold hidden, however skillfully, can escape from any man. Wiglaf went quickly, keen to get back, excited by the treasure. Anxiety weighed on his brave heart. He was hoping to find the leader of the Gaiats alive on open ground where he had left him. So he came to the place, carrying the treasure, and saw his lord, bleeding profusely, his life on the moon. Old Lord gazed sadly at the gold. I give thanks to the Lord Almighty, to the King of Glory, that I behold this treasure here before me. That I've been allowed to leave my people so well endowed the day that I die. Now that I've bartered my last breath, it is to you to look after their needs. I can hold out no longer. Then the king, in his great heartiness, unclasped the collar of gold from around his neck and gave it to the young thing. You. you are the last of us. The only one left of the Y Moondings. Fate has swept my whole brave Iborn clan to their final doom. And now I must follow him. That was the warrior's last word.
the dragon lay destroyed as well. Never again would he glitter and glide and show himself off in the midnight air, exulting in his riches. He had fallen to the earth through the battle strength in Beowulf's arm. They were few indeed, as far as I have heard. Big and brave as they may have been. Few who could have held out against the outpourings of that poison breather. Or gone foraging on the ring hall floor after dark and found the deep barrow dweller on guard and awake. The treasure had been won, bought and paid for by Beowulf's death. The Gayad people built a pyre for Beowulf, stacked and decked it till it stood four square, hung with heavy helmets, shining armor, and glittering shields. On a height they kindled the hugest of all funeral fires, Fumes of wood smoke billowed darkly up. The blaze roared and drowned out their weeping. The wind died down and flames wrought havoc in the hot bone house, burning it to the core. They wailed aloud for their lord's decease, for someone far famed and beloved. A Gayat woman, too, sang out in grief. Beluquem avoth freone fregan forth unsended Hird shulon singan gleomen soriende On me du selde that hermano ere His trude ne direst and my adorost. They extolled his heroic nature and exploits and gave thanks for his greatness. Which was the proper thing, for a man should praise a prince whom he holds dear and cherish his memory. So the Gaiad people, his hearth companions, sorrowed for the Lord who had been laid low. They said that of all the kings upon the earth, Quedem that he were, Warold Kunainga. Mana Mildus. And keenest to win fame, Leodum Laidus, on Lothgerlust. 